Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. You've probably heard of Feather Pattern, Damascus, or Pattern Welded Steel. There's a lot of cool designs out there by a bunch of different bladesmiths. But today we're gonna to try to take canister Damascus to a whole new level and make Feather Pattern Damascus with a bunch of these. Today I'm gonna to use a combination of 3 8 inch ball bearings and 3 16 inch ball bearings. I wanna see what the different sizes do for the uh, pattern weld that we're working on today. So ball bearings are pretty ubiquitous, they're easy to get, and they're the 5200 steel ones, which is what we're working with here. Those make a great blade. So something I've enjoyed working with, trying different techniques for different patterns. And today I'm gonna to use the most commonly known method, which is the canister Damascus as it's known. And you simply build yourself a steel can and put put all your stuff in there and weld it, weld it together in the forge, forge weld it up. So nice tight cap on the end here. This is two inch mild steel square tubing. That cap fits down in there and we can weld around it, make a nice secure container to hold everything together while we forge weld it. Get those cooled off. And these are not airtight weld welds. I don't, uh, I'm not an expert at stick welding so they're not airtight but I don't I don't want them to be actually and I'll explain that in a minute so the white paint here that's that's pretty important it keeps the contents of the can from welding to the can and unless you want to grind your can off in the, you know in the future I like to do it this way I don't like to have to worry about that so these are the 3 8 inch ball bearings and I'm gonna fill it up with powdered steel this is 1080 powdered steel with uh, four percent nickel powder added to that and that's going to provide a nice contrast between the powdered steel and the high carbon steel ball bearings it's important to make sure that as you're filling your canister up there's no voids and so you know I'll tap it down with a hammer but then to really get that uh, as dense as possible in there I like to use the sawzall and just get it uh, vibrated down and then we can put the cap the next cap on there and weld it up so I just repeated the same process with the 3 16 inch ball bearings and we'll see how that all turns out now this can here I it, I think it's airtight and just to make sure that it isn't airtight I'm gonna go ahead and drill a little vent hole with a with a 1 16 inch drill bit most of the time my welds are not airtight and there you go see there's uh, that powdered steel blowing out of there because it was getting hot from the arc welding so it was already building up pressure and if you don't have a vent hole it's gonna pop in your forge and that's not not a good thing so on the other one it did have a vent hole but just a pinhole in my weld and so th there's the one we drilled and then I'll pull out the next one here and show you the the uh, porous weld that I did which is sort of normal I'm not an expert at arc welding there it is right there what you're seeing there is the goo from the paint burning off uh, that's a technical term goo so get these up to a good forge welding heat and use the uh, v-shaped dies to squish it down in the press and run that run run it through there uh, multiple in multiple heats make sure we have a good uh, billet forged up here so we'll let those cool down a little bit before we start uh, tearing into the can and getting that can off so we can start working with our billet. I find the easiest way to remove the can is to cut off one corner and then cut the ends on three sides. And that allows me to start peeling the, uh, peeling the can off. And with that white paint, it really comes off it's, it doesn't it's not stuck at all so it's just a matter of bending that can back the a lot of people ask me about the white paint and as far as I know any any cheap white paint should work it's the titanium dioxide content in the paint that uh, prevents the contents from welding to the can so even though the binders and stuff or whatever it is burn off uh, the titanium dioxide stays behind so there's our two billets the 3 8 inch on the left and the 316s on the right. 
So you'll notice there's uh, multiple cracks along the corners and, and some, some along the surface of these billets. And when it comes to ball bearing canister Damascus, as far as I know, that's unavoidable. Uh, there's always going to be some surface uh, cracks that you have to deal with. And the reason for that is as you are um, forging it, forge welding it in the press, you are exerting mostly, you know, uh, lateral force on it, but also unavoidably some linear force. So in other words, you're also stretching it as you're, as you're squishing it. And so, you know, before that forge weld has a chance to fully uh, bond, you're already stretching it apart. And so you're just going to deal with some of that. And in this case, I had to go back and forth, I don't know, five or six times to take care of cracks, forge it out a little bit more, address some more cracks. And, and none of them are huge, but you can't leave them in there. So eventually, we got a nice clean bit of bar stock out of each billet and we'll get those cleaned up and start chopping it up into pieces for our feather pattern billet. Now on a feather pattern uh, Damascus build the length of stock that you have to work with at the end is directly related to the the height of your billet stack at about the point in the project that we're at right now and that will the reason for that will become readily apparent uh, to you in a few minutes but we get these cleaned up so that we've got a good surface to forge weld these all back together and you'll notice that the uh, the, the height of the stack here is only about two inches and we can stretch that out a little bit but that's going to be a pretty short blade to work with here uh, when you when you factor in the fact that you need a tang on your knife as well so so while I had envisioned making this entire blade from just the ball bearing Damascus, I think I obviously overestimated the quantity of material I was going to have. So to get a, a, an appropriate uh, amount of material here, I'm going to go ahead and incorporate some of this sawmill blade steel as well as some 1084 steel. So now we have a stack that's, while it's not huge, it's going to be tall enough, big enough, to actually make a decent blade out of with this project. Put that in some diesel to sit while we prep the next stage here. This is a piece of mild steel and it's three quarters by two and a half inches. Got a little uh, bit of slag in my glove there, scale in my glove there. And what I'm gonna do here is simply forge it down into a wedge shape. The way that feather pattern Damascus happens is by stacking up a billet of whatever it is that you're using and then cutting that in half vertically and then rewelding it back together. So we need a tool to cut that in half, uh, basically a big guillotine type deal that we can cut this billet with. So while mild steel really doesn't harden, you can get a tiny bit of hardness out of it by water quenching it. So I just went ahead and did that. I'm not really concerned with that because this is a minimal use tool and the cross section should be adequate for the application here. So get this fluxed up here so we can forge weld this stack and at this point I do not want to make this stack any shorter than I have to. Obviously I have to press it down to forge weld all those pieces together but you know that's the bare minimum to get it forge welded properly together so as you can see I'm just compressing it maybe an eighth of an inch here and I'll go back and forth a couple of times to get a couple of good forge welding heats on it and uh, get that forge welded together but keeping that as tall as possible at this point so here's our wedge tool again we'll grind that up and make it uh, smoother and more um, uniform and uh, concentric there's our forge welded billet and getting real close to the super fun part here. I have to go ahead and weld this um, cutting tool onto a die plate for my press so I can use it in the press. I'm going to go ahead and grind off the arc weld that was holding our billet together so that that's not a part of our stock from this point on. We don't want that in there. And here we go. So pretty simple concept simply cutting that from the top now there's a couple of things that I've never done this before so this was you know a great learning experience first thing that I figured out 
is that my wedge is too narrow down at the, the point there and it was too easy for the billet to stick on there. This is a little nerve wracking because if your welds aren't good enough then you can easily start peeling them apart just with this uh, lateral pressure. I don't know, just crushing it down like that. So, you know, you're dancing this line between a good forge weld, not crushing the, the stack too much to lose the length, and then there's also a line between having this wedge tool be uh, thick enough to, to, to cut through this stack and, and basically smear those lines down uh, but not be so obtuse that it it just kind of tears the uh, the stacks you know or the the welds in the stacks. So here you know the the wedge is a little bit too narrow and I'm running into that problem. I had to take it out and dress it on the grinder multiple times. The fact that it's mild seal also doesn't help. And there's uh, there's my little guy. He was pretty enthralled with uh, <laughs> seeing the forge over there. Looks like I think he's going to be a future uh, bladesmith. So there we go. We're, we're, we're cutting this all the way down, and I'm still fighting it. It's not wanting to come off. And, and I'm doing this in multiple heats because I'm trying to keep this billet nice and hot to minimize any, um, you know, pressure on those welds. If you tried to do this at too low a heat, you'd, you'd probably tear it up. So um, trying to keep it hot, you know, multiple trips back and forth and you see that that wedge tool it's pretty tore up it's you know it's not gonna hold up so really it needs to be thicker at, at the edge there and so you know the the re, the re uh, grinding that I had to do on it's not a big deal um, maybe in the future I'll make one from a, a tool steel or at least a carbon steel But anyway we've got two halves to the billet now and I'm gonna go ahead and heat them back up and, and make them nice and flat. Again, um, here's the point where you know, I probably could have forged these ones out more. I wasn't really sure how much I wanted to forge these out. What I've heard from other smiths is kind of the you know, rule of thumb is minimal forging on the feather pattern because uh, if you get too crazy with it, it kind of it kind of distorts the pattern. However, at this stage, I don't think that applies so much. And so I probably could have forged these down a little bit more, but in, but at any rate, we uh, we've got some nice flat surfaces uh, that we can go ahead and weld those back together. And you can see right there um, the lines of the of the layers of this billet, those different pieces of steel. You can see the, the layers there, and that's where our feather pattern is is coming from. Um, so I went ahead and arc welded around that seam, just sealed everything up, and we'll go ahead and forge weld these back together. Uh, what you also saw there is that the the curve on that feather pattern was uh, sort of uh, truncated or, or it didn't go all the way out to the edge. And I think that had to do with the fact that my wedge tool was too thin right there. I think it needed to be a little thicker as to kind of really smear those lines down in a nice arc. But these are all little details that you don't really figure out until you go do it. So went ahead and ground off that arc weld. We've got a nice forge weld those, on those two pieces, so it's back to being one piece with that seam down the middle. And go ahead and do a process anneal on it so that it's actually soft enough to, uh, to cut now. So we can go ahead and slice off a piece. And yeah, we're gonna get multiple blades out of this billet. So even though it was a lot of work, I spent a couple of days just on the billet. Um, you know, it's, it's not all for one blade, so that's, that's kind of nice. So I'll go ahead and grind off the, uh, the, the saw marks there and get a clean billet here and start forging our blade. So I'm paying attention here. I don't want to get too crazy on the forging. You know, these are, even though, even with good forge welds, if you get too crazy and don't forge at an appropriate heat, you can start to damage, uh, or start to damage your welds. And so, um, that's just, that's just the way it is, even with a, a, a good forge weld but um, just forge out a nice little blade here and getting the tang and so you see what I mean now with the length of our of our billet if I had if I had started with just the ball bearing 
uh, pattern Damascus or pattern welded steel, we would <laughs> we'd have a pretty small blade at this point. So got this forged out, and we'll go ahead and normalize it, run it through uh, another process anneal and, and a couple of grain refinements, and we can go ahead and start profiling the blade now. Because at this point, the only heat treat we have left is the hardening and then the tempering. So now I can grind off all this excess steel, not all of it, but get it a lot closer to our finished dimensions and still leave some, leave some stock on there that we'll grind off after tempering. So this is the rough grind and we'll get the uh, profile cleaned up and everything like that. Going into the quench here using Parks 50 since the majority of our blade steel did end up being the 1084 and 15 and 20 so you need a nice fast quench there. And we can go ahead and temper it up. Alright, it's time to finish grind this thing. So no cracks, nothing. It's uh, holding together great and uh, pretty happy with the way it's turning out so far. It's been a lot of work um, and I can see that the ball bearing um, method is probably more work than any other way that you could probably do the feather pattern in Damascus. So I'm hoping that the results are worth it. So we'll, we'll have to see. I guess, you know, if you've never done a project before, you might as well, you know, uh, try it the hard way <laughs> or something. I'm not sure. So got some hand sanding on here. Get this blade sanded up to 800 grit. And you can see that we don't have any lines, visible lines showing or anything like that. No indication of a forge weld on the blade to speak of. And that's what you want. So I got the blade etched and I forgot that I needed to grind in the shoulders for the, the bolster fit up. So I pulled it out of the etch and did this real quick. I'm using a file guide, which I just purchased this recently and I should have bought one years ago. But it's a file guide with carbide inserts and you can use it on that uh, aluminum oxide belt and it doesn't, it just barely scuffs it and that just makes it so much easier to get clean and even shoulders in and plunge lines for that matter. So we'll use a brass bolster here, drill that out and uh, fit it to the tang here using the Dremel tool and files. So I want it to fit snugly and um, you know you have to tap it on the last little bit here so you know I had it on and off the tang probably 10 or 15 times I don't know quite a few times but you want to you want it to fit fit nicely but not be something you have to beat on there with a sledgehammer obviously so I've got a piece of blood wood here that uh, I want to use for the handle and start we'll start drilling out the uh, the handle here for the tang to fit in so I ground the bottom of the blank of the block to uh, match the angle of the tang and in theory I guess that that works okay right here I'm grinding some little half moon shapes in the, the edge of the tang so that the epoxy in the handle has something to really lock into so this handle this tang is not coming out of this block so just to switch it up on you here I uh, didn't show it on camera but I actually ended up with a little crack in the uh, bloodwood block and so I switched to a, a desert ironwood block so Using, using the same method basically to fit that in there and I also did use the burn-in method to help with that. We get a good fit here and a um, little excess epoxy there but better to have a little excess than not enough. Make sure there's no voids in that whole assembly. Using my makeshift but very serviceable clamp to hold everything together and let that cure overnight so now we can go ahead and shape the handle and I didn't show it but the etching process takes multiple trips in and out of the ferric chloride that you saw me put the blade in and 
sanding the blade with a high grit paper. Some of these things uh, you could probably make a video on all by themselves, but for the, the sake of brevity, I guess, and moving the project along, don't need to show every single tiny step per se. So get this, this ironwood block shaped up. I'm really happy with how the fit up went with this uh, bolster and the, uh, the double black micarta between the ironwood and the brass. Makes for a nice and serviceable handle. Do some more hand sanding and get this all ready to go. All right guys, we are finished building this knife. It turned out pretty cool. I'm gonna show you the whole thing in just a second, so hang on. But, you know, overall I'm happy with this as the first blade ever like this one that I've done. So there's gonna be things I do differently in the future, of course, but, you know, learning as you go, that's all sort of part of the point. So fun educational project for me and hopefully it was for you as well. And if so, consider supporting the channel. It doesn't cost you anything to hit like, subscribe, hit that notifications bell, leave a comment. All of that stuff helps me continue to bring you cool content like this. So I sure appreciate it. If you wanna go a step further, there is a Patreon link in the description below and my website link. And on that note, if you want a knife like this or one of the many other ones that I make or an ax, something like that, go ahead and get on my email list. That's on the front page of my website. Just scroll down a little bit and you'll see it. I send out notifications when I have new batches of blades ready to go. So as always, I appreciate it and we will see you on the next video.